the Women's Six Nations show on OTB Sports. In association with Guinness, hashtag never settle. Drink responsibly, visit drinkaware.ie. Welcome to the Women's Six Nations show in association with Guinness, proud partners of the Irish rugby team. I'm Valerie Wheeler and this week I have two great guests, 2013 Grand Slam winning captain Fiona Coughlin and of course the most capped player in Irish history, Brian O'Driscoll. Brian and Fiona, welcome to the show. Cheers, thanks yeah, Delighted to be here. I'm first of all I need to say that I'm delighted that I can see you both here because last night you did attempt an Instagram live <laughs> and the internet was just no good technical difficulties for both Brian the internet's okay today internet's a lot quicker today speed test done up around the 450 mark so um yeah no complaints on that regard tech probably not being my strong point at the best of times so when something goes down it's full-on panic stations <laughs> Um, and yeah, we had a couple of full stones with our Insta Live, but we got there eventually, didn't we, Fiona? And um, yeah, it was great to be to get to chat about the uh, performance at the weekend, and, and looking forward to France a little bit, and just the overview of where women's rugby is at the minute. Yeah, it was great. It was lovely, and more of the same next week. But last week, Ireland did get their Six Nations campaign underway with a. Absolutely amazing performance and a great win over Wales. Fiona, what a start to the campaign. Oh, look, when you've played one game in 13 months and they had so many camps, you just wonder what's actually going to come when you go out to play an international level. But they've spoken so much about the training they were doing in those camps. And we certainly saw, particularly in the first 40 minutes, they came out all guns firing. And um, I was so excited even watching it and being able to commentate it on. It was just brilliant. It was so positive in, in every facet of the play. Brian, plenty of positives, a lot impressed you? Yeah, like besides the obvious um, individual performers, standout performers, I, I thought for a team that hadn't played for so long, there was an incredible amount of cohesion, a real understanding between backs and forwards, what way they wanted to play the game. Um, you know, small little impressive nuances that you wouldn't maybe have expected, you know, they, you would have thought they would have found their way into the game a little bit. And you really kind of played with a very simplistic game plan, but there was, there was some really nice additions very early on, those little tip on passes from the forward pods, some, you know, great attempts at offloading. And yes, there were errors and, and it's always nice when you have a, 45 point victory that any coach is able to go well you know you did that really well but look over here how much better you can get and how much better you will need to get against better opposition i think there might have been 14 or 15 handling errors and that's you know that was um there was no shock that something like that when you're trying new new tactics and you're trying to play a new way and you haven't played together that's that's inevitable but it was an incredibly impressive all-round performance particularly the first half i think things you know, Wales woke up in the second half and there was more, you know, you got a little bit disjointed with subs coming on. It invariably happens where it's hard to get the, the you know, to, for the team to understand their balance uh, immediately. So um, it was a, a very, very good start from, from this Irish team that um, has had to sit on their hands for long periods. And, and many of them haven't even had the opportunity to play club rugby. So they look brilliantly conditioned, fast, fit and really hungry. Fiona, where for you was it won? Where in the game that it kind of impressed you the most? Well, just I, not so much won there, but just their attack over the last number of seasons was something that we kind of questioned and we didn't see what direction that they were trying to play. And I suppose some of that came down to the, the changes that have been consistently made in the 10 positions, like Hannah Tyrrell was the eighth number 10 there and it was only her second cap there. I just thought there was a bit more clarity on, on the way they were trying to attack. They were certainly looking to get the ball wider into their th more threatening players. Um, and the, as Brian said, the link between the backs and forwards wasn't there previously. It was very much like the forwards would do their things and then the backs would go off and do theirs. So just that whole gelling between those two was the most impressive thing for me. But, you know, to win a game, I suppose you need your set piece to, to launch off. And that had, again, improved both the line out and the scrum. And then the battle at the breakdown, you know, you, you have to look at it and say, Wales weren't up to much. But previously, in years gone by, Probably, Ireland probably would have lowered their level to a team like that, but they didn't. They um, they lifted it to a whole new level this time. So I, I was really impressed with that, the mental side to it. And, you know, putting in all, all that training, um, you, you're obviously physically prepared, but that mental to raise it up to international st standard again, and that was certainly impressive from them. 
You mentioned just that. On, on top yep. of that as well, uh, yeah, Fiona. I, I think there's there was some of the things that really Im impressed were some of the individual decisions as well, and the, and the timing and the understanding of what they were trying to do. You know, we talk about you see the pod off nine an awful lot, carrying you know the hard yards into the first three or four defenders. The easy thing to do when you're that ball carrier is to square your shoulders up and run back towards where the ball has come from because that's where you're in a stronger position running in closer to the rook. Whereas the beneficial thing for the team is to try and actually crab across the field and get to the third, fourth, fifth defender. And the reason for that is it, it forces the defense to fold around the corner and particularly as the game progresses, the longer you go on, players get a little bit more tired, they get a little bit lazier, and that's when you get your mismatches on the outside. So McDermott was doing it really well, Wall was doing it really well, rather than you know catching it and then literally you know pinning their ears back at the second defender, they're getting to the fourth defender and, and straight away shortening the defensive line outside. So small little things like that I thought were were really impressive and something that I've banged on in the men's game for, for years that the players don't seem to understand the necessity to work teams around the corner and short, shorten the line and then inevitably get the fast men on people just coming around late to the defensive set. Yeah, and I think that was evident throughout. And like you said, the tip on passes or even the forwards using the full back pass as well to create that more width out wide and, and stretch the defence. Um, so hopefully they'll, they'll develop on that as the games go on and they get a little bit more comfortable. But I think sometimes coming up against more pressurised teams, like they really had it. They had so much time on the ball as well, um, which allowed them to do that and allowed to implement them what they wanted to do. So they might not get those opportunities again. But look, you know, you played the team in front of you and they certainly took uh, every advantage that they could over Wales. Something that was quite evident last week for a lot of us was maybe their confidence heading into the game. A lot of people were kind of worried, were they too confident, were they not? But during the week, I was chatting to Sene Niopo and she said it was something, it wasn't a conscious thing that they were trying to do. So let's just take a quick listen. We're you know, very aware of um, the quality side and, and the team that we're playing at the weekend, uh, but we're also aware as well of that level of preparation, the world-class coaching that we have, world-class facilities. I've got world-class teammates. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you put that all together and I suppose, you know, with our, our coaches, they've empowered our environment where, you know, it's it's brilliant to see Kira Griffin, our captain, thriving and our leadership group supporting her and the peer group, you know, doing their role. So, you know, at the end of the day, all of us have been able to just do our role and execute and, you know, we'll be focusing on uh, sharpening the saw this week for, uh, for France. That was in Ineopo chatting to myself during the week. Fiona, last week, were you surprised with how confident they were? I suppose it's very unlike an Irish team to come out uh, singing and dancing like that. But I think it was the confidence and what they put in over the time. You know, if you put it in perspective, normally they would only have four camps going into a Six Nations and one of those would be a trial game. This time they had an increased camp to 20 camps, but they also went in on a Friday evening, so they get a ha an extra half session. So there was huge volumes of work done. They were very confident in, in about the shape that they were trying to do. Um, so I, I still was a bit surprised they were that confident, but look, they backed it up. And once you back it up, well, then it puts all, all us down. So um, yeah, fair play to them. And I just hope that they bring the confidence now into the next game because they proved that they're able to play that way and just back it up again this week. Brian, that media training for you all those years ago wouldn't have allowed you to do something like that last week, would it? <laughs> I know, but like it's it's horses for courses. It's 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 you know different things. We don't have to just typecast um, ourselves as as an as an Irish team. You can you can feel the vibe in a room or how things are going in training and what way you want to pitch things. And as Fiona said, the really important part of you know, talking a good game is then backing it up and they've delivered that and people, you know, will scrutinize the second half performance, but, you know, let's, let's take it into context of how long it had been since they had played together um, before that. So it was, there was so much positive stuff to take from it, but they also know that, that a performance probably even at that level won't be enough against this French team. So, you know, rugby can be humbling. You can be, you know, top of the tree one one week, and you know things can can turn around. So I think it, it keeps the focus very very sharp to make sure that you continue to improve on what you've delivered, irrespective of the opposition.
It's about your own focus. And even teams that go and win tournaments you know, year on year, sometimes it's not about trying to be better than the opposition. It's trying to be better than you were the previous year. And I think that has to be a focus. To get, the better you get, the more you improve on your own standards. Fiona, what can we take against the Wales game and what can we take with France against their Wales game? Yeah, look, I think it was both, um, obviously, similar scorelines um, and similar as well. France dominated in every facet, uh, facet of the game as well. So, um, you know, on that, they would look very easily matched. And uh, now you have to take into account that France probably didn't start all, what we would deem their starting 15, that a few on the bench to give a couple of new caps. Um, so it'll be interesting to see squad selection from France. But on, on the face of it, they look very balanced in, in the forwards and the backs. And, you know, both have pace out wide. France are probably a bigger pack. They probably have a bit more weight and will pack, pack a bit more of a punch. But I think Ireland can be clever about it, the way that they move France around the park and, and they use, looking like Brian said, to get that width on the ball outside the third, fourth defender and, and move France around the park. But um, on the face of it, yeah, they look balanced. They look evenly matched. I just can't wait to see uh, squad selections and, yeah, go from there. That squad selection is, of course, at quarter past two today, and we will chat about that a little later on. But before we get into the France game the weekend, I mean, last weekend was such an amazing weekend for women in sport between the rugby and Rachel Blackmore, just to name a few. Brian, it's great to see the visibility. It's finally happening. You know, it's all positive signs. Yeah, it is. It's, um, in, in some regards, been a long time in coming. And... Um, I think the important place that we want to get to is is normalizing the you know the media um, coverage around women's sport. You know, as part of of you know the Guinness Never Settle campaign, they they have showcased that only six percent of of media output is uh, sporting output is on women's sport, which is insane. And it does it has felt over the last certainly my lifetime that you've had to really be extraordinary uh, at an international level, at a real cutting edge level to get any kudos um, in, in Irish media. You think about Katie Taylor, you think about Sonia O'Sullivan, but if you think about comparatively to men's, yes, we get that, but you think about all the different levels and layers below that where it, you know, it can be um, very niche and still get uh, publicity, or it could be just, you know, um, you know, National League, and it's still getting publicized. So I think we've got to try and strike the balance. But it, it, it's brilliant to have poster girls for um, aspiring young, um, you want to be athletes and, and sports people um, to, to identify someone, a route to uh, a goal that they want to achieve. And that is really important. It is, you know, part of the 20 by 20 campaign. If you can't see it, can't be it. It's so true. Um, and um, anytime that you know, the Jackie Hurley, I've, I've talked about this before, but Jackie Hurley has a brilliant book called, you know, Girls Play Too. And talking to my daughter about it, you know, she gets inspired by seeing all these different women competing at different sports and, oh, they can do it. And there's something, you know, clicks in their brain when they go, if they're able to do it, well, well, you know, I'm a girl too, why can't I do it? And you just need more repetition, more visibility, and, um, and eventually we'll, we'll change the curve. Fiona, for yeah, I you... Know. For you? I just I think it's consistency in that coverage, you know, that six percent in order to rise. If you look back, that survey was probably done over the last year and you'd the likes of Katie Taylor, you know, doing what she did, Sunita Puspora with World and Europeans and Rachel Blackmore even last year. So they probably would have taken the bulk of that media coverage and it's it's the others below it that probably aren't getting anything that are because they're not achieving at that top level week in, week out. So that's where we need to get to. It's the consistency below those kind of world beaters in order to bring the exposure of everyone and I don't know, Valerie, from you, from a journalist's point of view, trying to find out information on, on female sports teams is really tough. And in fairness to Guinness, they're putting together a Wikipedia page for all of, all of the Six Nations team players. And like when you're going to profile a team prior to doing commentary or prior to reporting, trying to get information is really, really tough. And I think that's, that's a game changer. Like, and it's a tangible thing that we can see changing immediately um, that I think firstly will make a difference for coverage from journalists, but also fan engagement, because they do want to know about these people. They want to know their backgrounds, you know, what they do, where they come from. And that, that buy-in from the fans comes from the visibility piece as well. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on finding information on these players is extremely difficult. But Brian, how do we change the value of women's sport in society in Ireland? So... 
I, I, I like I said, I think it's it's just normalizing it. And and it's funny at the moment, right? You look at Twitter feeds and Instagram feeds, and something that in the past has been very male dominant. And and Irish rugby is a good example. You know, they've tried over the last few years, but not to the degree of what we're seeing at the moment during this um you know, you know Six Nations championship where you know, every other post is men, women, and um, and while it's women's time, that's the focus. And I think it it feels at the moment, it feels, oh, that's that's unusual that we're getting to see so much of that. But that's wrong that we have that, that we're feeling that emotion, that it's not just, oh, yeah, of course, it's it's the time to be, you know, it's women's six nations. Of course, we're going to be seeing more content. We're going to be seeing more interviews. We're going to be seeing more analysis. So it's about getting to that place. And it will take a period of time because... You're going to always have the detractors. You're going to have people, anytime I post something about female sports, you'll, I'll always have some gobshite sliding into my DMs and telling me, don't watch that nonsense, or surely you can't be into that, or um, women don't even like sports, so why are you putting on you know, women's sports? And until you, repetition will only allow for those people to be sifted out and to change their opinions and it's you know what some things aren't going to be for everyone and but you don't want them supporting you either so I, I do feel as though it's just about uh, you know being continuous with this and um and staying the course and I think we will eventually turn the tide in in the perception of you know what um, the appetite is for female sport out there as well. Brian, you did mention on the Instagram Live last night that your son was introduced to women's rugby for the first time this week. Yeah. So am I part of the problem? I must be part of the problem that I've never watched a game um, with with my son, a, female, a women's game. So um, it's, you know, we will 100% be sitting down this Saturday afternoon. He said, oh, gosh, yeah, can I watch the game with you? We sit down not usually on the laptop, but watch down, sit down and watch games together. And then he said, oh, girl, women play rugby too. I said, yeah, of course they do. So I've never seen one. So that's it. So in my head now, we got to try and lock that in. And kids don't care about men and women. They just want to see sport. So it's something changes over the course of their adolescence that, you know, be a message being reinforced or circumstances or situations they see in school where there's a focus towards male sport than female sport. So we've got to change that in an underage level as well. But I think it's about normalizing other things. Another thing that I, I did yesterday was looking at the game. I saw Lindsay Pete at one stage just tripping up on her own and, and snotting herself. And I was about to take a video of it and then kind of post it just having a laugh and tag her in it um, and saying a sniper took you out from the, from the roof, was it? And But then I thought, gosh, I don't know if we're there yet. I don't know, am I able to, is that going to come across as being seen as being a bit sneery and, and kind of bashing? So I didn't do it. But we want to get to a point where that's okay. And I doesn't feel like, I certainly won't be, won't be that long before I'm starting to do that. <laughs> but I think that's part of it. I'll do it in the men's game. You got to do it in the women's game. You know, I won't talk about anyone's off-field antics in the men's game. I won't do the same in the women's game. But you critique the same way and you applaud the same way. And that's the level that you want to get to. And as players, I can assure you that these girls want to be critiqued fairly. They don't want to be you know, given you know, a, a soft hand and, and be told they're doing a great job and sure isn't it great to have them on TV. They want genuine... Um, acclamation when it goes well and they and they want well they mightn't want criticism when it's not going well but they want honest truth and home truth and and constructive criticism and i think that's the point we've got to get to, to delivering that on on both fronts yeah i think Lindsay put that up herself so you're okay brian <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <laughs> Well, it is great, and I think we're only trying our best to move it forward, and it's all positive signs, and let's normalise the conversation and normalise everyone watching it. But Fiona, something else that's great, really, with the Women's Six Nation at the moment is the structure, the format. It's being on its own. It has its own window. It's an opportunity to shine. Yeah, I love the move in calendar. I think it's brilliant because, obviously, during February, March, you're always competing for... I suppose everything where location where they play you know tv print media everything is so consumed in the men's game and um, obviously last week the women's game was up against 
Aintree Grand National and the Leinster game, but still the viewership was quite good. And I think there was loads of media in the run-up to it as well. And, and this week, similarly. So I'm, I'm really positive about that move in, in the calendar. I'm not so positive about the reduction in the number of games. And I know that was due to COVID this year and potential um, World Cup qualifiers either side. So look, fair enough, it had to be reduced this year. But going forward, I would be a fan of having the normal, you know, you play everyone and you pitch yourself against everyone. And, you know, obviously there is a bit of a, France and England have been leading the way and the other four, it's been tit or tap between them. So they're actually sometimes really good quality games when they're evenly matched like that. So I, I think that's important that those teams get to play each other again. But, you know, positive where it is in the calendar. Yeah, plenty of positives to take, Mitch. You are listening to the Women's Six Nations show on OTB Sports in association with Guinness, proud partner of the Irish rugby team. Now that we have you both here, it's important that we look ahead to this weekend, Ireland's next game against France. I mean, how important is a quick start this weekend, Fiona? They had a quick start last weekend, Ireland, which was great. But this weekend, how important is it? Yeah, I think um, you have to come out and you have to meet France because if you let them get their, their tails up, they'll, they'll just continue to go and they'll just mow you down. So it's important that Ireland come out, come out really quickly. Um, you know, again, I'll harp back to the second piece in the breakdown. I think it's just vital for them going forward to get the exciting players, the likes of Dar um, David Parsons, into the game. Um, so that's really important. A couple, like if it doesn't go to plan at the start, I actually believe this team is resilient, that they will bounce back. I just think what they've been through in the last year that we've seen a lot of their resilience. And for me, this week, it's about the performance. It's not about that win. The biggest thing this year is the World Cup qualifier and working towards that. Obviously, the team want to get the win against France to go into that one-two playoff. But uh, I think what's more important is the performance, regardless of the results at the end of the day. Brian, for you the weekend, France, a total different side to Wales, semi-pro. It's a massive step up. Yeah, it is a big step up. Um, but you, as an international player, you want to play against the better teams as well, because that's where you learn more about yourself and, and an understanding of where you can pitch yourself against the best. It's easy to play, you know, it's, listen, it's a confidence builder. And, and certainly it, it worked out well last weekend that um, a lot of what they tried worked well. But ultimately, they'll know, they do know that they'll have to improve their performance against a much more physical French team, a very skillful backline as well. I think, you know, you look at the, their performance, uh, France's performance against Wales a, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, they've got some some new blood coming in there as well um, that, you know, have, have been keeping some of the old guard at bay. A um, couple of great debuts. You've got players like uh, Pauline Burdon playing at nine, um, who's, who's the kind of stereotypical um, you know, French nine, that pretty general goal kicking, can, you know, can move to 10, no problem. Um, and, and kind of facilitates exactly how they want to play. But they've got some really good ball players. That, the, the girl, um, is it Verbier, is, is, was her name? 12. The, the 12, Ver, Vernier, the 12. Like, you know, she threw this sumptuous Sunny Bill offload in the, in the game against um, Wales. And we'd be, we'd be loading that if it was, you know, Sunny Bill. So we got to, you know, load, um, you know, the quality that we're seeing as well that, that is clearly um, on display. So, when you've got ball players like her and then the firepower um, of some of the outside backs, it, it's a very different proposition against this French team. So stop the ball at source and try to make sure that your defensive line is set and you're getting good line speed and putting huge pressure on them. Uh, just, Valerie, just back to the good start against France. This is such a typical French team in the fact that they haven't travelled well in the past. Last year, they went to Scotland and they drew 13-0 with Scotland. Two years ago, they went to Italy and were beaten at the park 31-12. So if you get a good start against them and put doubts in their mind, I don't think they've yet developed that kind of, that fight back, just because they haven't had to do it consistently. So if they, Ireland get that good start and ask questions of France, I think they will be in a, in a better position. Well, we need to take a look at some individual performances. And I know when it comes to analysing Ireland over the last week or so, there's always one name that does pop up. She was speaking to Ger Gilroy and Neil Tracy on Off The Ball AM on Monday. And this lady, Bevan Parsons, she knows that she's not developed yet. And it's quite scary to think that. But let's take a listen. Would you ever play much further in fields, Bevan? Get on the ball a little bit kind of more centrally in the pitch? Or do you prefer to have that space outside? 
Yeah, working in and working in off my nines and tens and getting on, on the ball in the midfield is something I'm trying to bring into my game. I still have to, you know, spot the gaps and make sure I'm running the right running lines and not getting in the way. So it's something I'm working on at training and I definitely want to bring that into my game. Uh, of course, I love having the space on the wing and being able to manipulate defenders. Um, but I think the, the mix of the two makes a great winger. So I'm definitely trying to bring that into my game. Bevan Parsons chatting to OTBM on Monday morning. Brian, this woman surely excites you. Yeah, she really does. You know, she doesn't talk like a 19-year-old either, does she? You know, I know she's in the Irish squad a few years now. Um, I, I believe that she had to have her own room because she was so young at 16 <laughs> when she initially got into the into the squad. Um, yeah, she she's very, very exciting. And she's the sort of player that that teams can be built around. Now, I know she plays on the wing, but when you've got go-to players of her capabilities and her, her strengths of speed and power, um, you want to get as many touches, get her as many touches as you possibly can. And she, you know, she's clearly um, wanting to learn. She wants to develop. And, you know, the thought of how good she could be in three, four, five years, you know, in, in most um, rugby um, careers, certainly in professional careers, players tend not to. I think we've lost Brian just for a few moments there. Fiona, do you want to maybe pick up on the performance of Bevan Parsons and how do you know incredibly scary it could be in the next few years when she fully develops? Yeah, look, I think even as a 16-year-old getting your first cap, the reason that she got it at 16, because athletically she was ready to step up to that level. Like she Develop had until 26, 27 to peak her in, you know, kind of with multiple tacklers, but yet in the wide extremities, she talks about manipulating defences and using her footwork. So um, am I gone here now? Um, we have you back. So, we have you yeah, back. Yeah, a very, very exciting prospect. That, that bit was the gold a bit that I froze on. Yeah. Um, that was, yeah, you'll we never missed get the that best again. bit. That we'll was, never get that, that was, again, you know. Fiona, do you want to continue maybe, and uh, as we mentioned, how good she can be, how scary it is she knows she's not fully developed yet? Yeah, I suppose, firstly, at 16, she was physically developed enough that she hadn't even played a senior game at club or inter-pro level to step up to Ireland. So genetically, she just is that freakish nature. But then her work rate and her hunger to be better and get better. And I know she speaks about working off the ball, but you will hopefully see, well, maybe not hopefully, but see a bit more of her defensive side with it again. She's a clever defender. They use um, a banana up on the outside defense, uh, which we see, saw last year. And she's integral in that. Uh, she got her intercept try against Scotland from that. So look, I just, it's the rugby world is her oyster, whatever she wants to do, but not just her. I think any of these young players that are coming through, that have come through minis and youth, up to senior, they just have a training age that is greater than like the likes of me when I started at, at 20. You know, they they have the basics already when they set up and now they're physically developed. So you have the likes of Dorothy Wall, Eve Higgins, you know, these players that just, they're 19, 20 and they just have so many years ahead of them. And it's just, it's really exciting for Irish rugby. Fiona, is she, is she definitely a winger or, you know, sometimes you want to get your players closer into the action. So is she someone that has the capabilities of, you know, of becoming a center, of becoming, you know, an outside half at some point? Or does it feel like her, her strengths will always lie out in that back three where she'll get a little bit more space and time? Um, I would imagine she's the type of player that you can play anywhere. Brian, I think coming up through the ranks at underage, she was put out in the wing because she's blitzed anyone and she's doing it at the international level as well. But, um, you know, her skill development over the years, she's now in the sevens program, so she'll be training day in, day out. Um, I, I've no doubt that she could, could move in further, but are you taking then away one of your best threats out wide? It depends on what way they, they want to play, I suppose. And um, if they're capable of getting the ball to her, consistently well then yeah the wing is fine but if, if they're going to struggle to get the ball to her on the wing you'd certainly have to look at moving her in because even in tight close contact she's the power to break through and um as i said her fundamental skills would be good so it's certain that they could look at through the line like you look at lynn cantwell she originally started on the wing and ended up at 13 um, and was an outstanding world-class 13 so uh probably similar lynn came from an athletics background and she had the speed on the wing and then just has developed as a rugby player, moving to 13. Played a few games of 10 as well, actually. <laughs> no pressure on poor old babe in Parton and Parson on ni at 19 years of age. Brian, someone else for you, though, you thought Dorothy Wall impressed you? 
Yeah, she looked really good. I couldn't believe, um, you know, she's still she's still only you know twenty herself. You know, she looked so um, she looked very experienced. She looked very confident what she was doing. You know, physically packed a huge punch. She's sort of the stereotypical six that every team wants. Someone that gets through an awful lot of graft on both sides of the ball. Big, you know, collision winner, but gets you those hard yards as well. Eke out five six yards when you're in close uh, close contact. Um, and then I, I suppose one of the things that's very evident and, and someone brought it to my attention, look at the before and after pictures of her from a conditioning point of view of 18 months ago. She's transformed into this great athlete from someone that was probably carrying a little bit, bit of too much timber um, in, in her kind of late teenage years. And it just shows that all of those camps that they have been in the national um, training facility, you know, together for has really come to fruition. She's when we look, when we've all been delving into the chocolate drawer during the pandemic, she clearly hasn't been. She's been drinking her protein shakes and she's been working hard because um, she looks like a very different um, you know, person and, and you know, physical specimen to the one um, that that was playing underage level. Um, so yeah, very very. Um, impressed with her overall performance and again say similar to Bailey and it's 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 those sort of players at a young age when they show so much potential it's how do you build those little mini teams around them and make them a focal point because you know they are on their day really world-class operators and they will write they will bring the level of everyone else's performance up with them. Fiona have they the support now around them to make them the stars that they could be? I think the structure that they're in, in in terms of their strength and conditioning, their skills, the, the level of coaching they're getting, as I said, I think Dorothy is still in the sevens as well. So her skills and, and fitness are going to continue to improve. So um, I think the structures there certainly are, you know, uh, obviously they would be training every day. They'll get recovery as well. They're both students. So um, a lot of their stuff is online. So it's not having to go into college every day. So they'll get recovery that they need in, in order to, you know, get bigger, faster, stronger, if that's even possible with Baven. But yeah, no, those structures are there. And um, I just, like, the likes of Dorothy, we haven't seen a player like her play for Ireland ever. You know, that's probably what we've always lacked is that physical, athletic forward. Um, so that's hugely exciting. And just the, the, their age profile as well is the thing. And yeah, it's, it's really exciting, you know. And I think the pack... Now, look, Terry, if you look at the way Ireland used her off the line out to strike in the middle of the field, whether it be her going hard looking for gain line, or, or we, I'm sure we're going to see her, her ball handling skills come into play a little bit more because she comes from a basketball background. So I've no doubt that she has really good skills anyway, that hand-eye coordination. So hopefully we'll see a little bit more of that going forward. Last week, Brian, for you, there was some errors. So we, we could see that Ireland did make some errors. What are those errors? And this week against France, they can't afford to make them. I, I think it was just um, it was just handling errors and and you know sometimes that just that happens when you haven't like I said when you haven't played together for a long period of time and also when you're trying things and you know particularly when things loosened up a little bit they were able to push the pass a bit more and some didn't quite stick and you know the referee missed one or two things where. It, you know, they were they were construed as knock knock ons when the ball was ripped out of the tackles, small things like that. So that so the numbers probably weren't quite as high as as was the reality. But they're they're fixes. You're going to have you know some ball handling in in every single game. That's the reality of the sport. So it's just a matter of trying to limit them. And when you do have them, that you aren't punished. That you're able to transition then from attack into defense. And that's where really good teams and and the French don't need a second invitation to identify you know turnover ball and and get it to the extremities and get it to their firepower so yeah I think you just don't want to compound an error with another error if it does happen get down on the ball or make sure you you make a first up shot and and get organized um but you know there was so much you know predominantly so much good stuff great set pieces Fiona said um scrum looked like a real um, like a like a, a real weapon, and I have to say, France didn't look as though they had it all their own way against Wales in the scrum, and yet we decimated Wales scrum. So that'll be a, a key battleground at the weekend, and certainly, you know, from a forward perspective, and, and I'm on um, the call with you know one of the foremost in, in Irish history, and she'd be better served to, to talk about this. But it, the the mentality around getting the um, getting the edge at scrum has such a huge beneficial um, effect, psychological effect to the rest of the game. And, um, and if Ireland can do that, get the impetus there, 
but it'll be a great platform for them. I think uh, an area that they'll certainly look to improve on is their penalty count. I think it was up at 14 penalties. Certainly when they, they weren't under any pressure from Wales, so giving away those kind of cheap entries into the game, they won't get away with it against France. So I think all week they'll probably be looking at, at their penalty count and trying to reduce that because, you know, one, France have a kicker, and two, they have that set piece to launch off as well. Their, their line out, they've used their line out numerous times um, to maul off. I think they scored two, two maul tries against Wales. And Ireland haven't been tested in that area, their mole defence. So I have no doubt that France are going to use it both in midfield to set up as a launch and, and then to look for the try 10 metres out and so. So um, Ireland can't let them get into those positions with cheap and lazy penalties. Good. Well, it's great. Uh, we really look forward to the game. A Saturday, a quarter past two in Donny McBride. Can Ireland do it? Yeah, of course they can. I, I think... Um, Based on the on the performance um, last weekend, you know they shouldn't be fearful because they they hit the ground running. Um, but they, you know, against all good opposition, you just have to raise your game again. But they're very capable of doing it, um, and you know they just have to identify some of the strengths of where France will come at them. I think that mall is a really interesting one. Um, the you know to try and deny possession first and foremost and stop them there. Um, and, and interestingly, you know what Fiona talked about, the penalty count, even against against Wales, France went 21 nil up and then they still started kicking three pointers. So they know how to keep that scoreboard ticking over. They're not a greedy team. They're happy to build on uh, on good work done by just taking you know three points instead of looking for fives and sevens. So you have to be very mindful with such a, a good uh, goal kicker as uh, Bourdon is that you, you can't give her easy shots at goal. Um, and because all of a sudden you, you haven't done, you, you, know, you felt as though you haven't done a huge amount wrong, and you might give four or five penalties away. That's fifteen points. So um, yeah, Ireland can do it, um, but again, intensity for eighty minutes uh, this time round, and, and just a few less um, uh, handling errors. Fiona, can we win? Look, it's it's going to be incredibly tough. When I look at this and I look at paper and the setup of these French girls play, playing win, week in, week out in their top 16 um, games, I think France are favourites. But if you look back historically, 2017, Ireland team was in disarray. France came to town and the Irish team came together and beat France 13-10. And I said before, they're not a good travelling team. If you put questions in their mind at the start, um, they, they'll implode. So that's the key for Ireland is to, to get the good start. You spoke about Valerie and go from there. I think this is a far better team across the park. Um, I think they're way more cohesive in the, in the style that they're trying to play. So they're definitely going to shout. But I said from the start, performance is the most important thing. I know they'll be after the win, but for me, performance is the most important thing. Well, brilliant. It was great to get you both on this week. Thank you so much, Brian O'Driscoll and Fiona Coughlin. It is the Women's Six Nations show on OTB Sports in association with Guinness. They are a proud partner of the Irish rugby team. I will be back next week to see how our Ireland got on with France and, of course, to see how they fare going into the finals weekend. The Women's Six Nations show on OTB Sports. In association with Guinness, drink responsibly, visit drinkaware.ie.